Hey guys, good morning. So uh, generosity is, sounds really fun by the bumper. Um, I'm excited to talk about that today. I, uh, I'm just teasing. I really am excited. I, I listened to a pastor one time, uh, and it wasn't Joel. Joel's in the audience. He's like, another pastor? How dare you in your adulterous heart? I wonder, I wonder if you'll be forgiven for that. But I listened to another pastor. His name was T.D. Jakes. And T.D. Jakes is a reverend down in Texas, and T.D. Jakes runs one of the biggest churches in the United States, and he was talking in an interview about a kid, a young man that he had in his church that was destined for ministry. He was called to it. He was good at it. He was zealous, and he knew he was supposed to be in that field, and so T.D. Jakes decided to take him under his wing and to mentor him, and they would sit together, and they would talk together, and they would discuss what that life looks like and what it means, and because the kid was talented and he was confident, Every once in a while, the kid would kind of go off into this, this speech about what he was going to do and how he was going to change the world and he was going to uh, do this with his church or maybe he was going to do that and maybe he was going to look like this and I don't know if I want it to be this or that. And T.D. Jake said that one day he kind of lost his patience and he grabbed the kid by the shoulders and he shook him. And if you've ever listened to T.D. Jake's preach, I actually believe that he shook him and he said to him in his face, he said, listen to me, son. Where you're supposed to be in life and how you specifically build for the kingdom will flesh itself out in time. But hear me when I tell you this. The only position available in the kingdom of God is that of a servant. There's not a menu of options. There's not an array of things you can be. The only position available in the kingdom of God is that of a servant. And what that means is that if you have one strong bone in your body, one gift, one talent, one ability, the only thing that God promises over and over and over again is that it's not for you. It's for somebody else. And I remember hearing this shortly into my stint in ministry, and I was like overwhelmed by it. I was like, I don't know if that sounds fun. That sounds really hard. That sounds demanding. That sounds costly and sacrificial. I don't know if I can do that. And as I've been in this field, I've realized a couple things. I've only been here for a year, and I was brand new before, so take this with a grain of salt. But as I've been doing this, what I realize about that quote and about this subject is that that's not specific to the field of ministry vocationally. That is every single person who considers themselves a Christ follower. That is our calling. We are to be servants. We are to pour out. Why? Because there's this beautiful paradox that we live in as Christians and on one side, the truth is that this world is not as it should be. Things are not quite right. All you have to do is open up the paper, look on the internet, and read about it. I mean, read about what happened in Texas last weekend. Read about what happened in Syria over the last five years or in Yemen over the last two years. This world is not quite as it should be. But on the flip side, the ultimate hope for all of us who consider ourselves Christians is that one day, God will come and redeem it all. It will all be set to right once and for all, and that's the hope that we live in. But the beautiful thing about that hope and the thing that makes me the most excited about being a Christ follower in this world in the present is that we are not actually called to wait for that to happen. We are called to be a part of it. We are called as Christ followers, as Jesus followers, to be people who in this world in the present make changes, who go out into the world and pour ourselves out and change people's lives with love, with care, with hope, with joy. There is restoration to be had here in the now. The thing about the Christian mission that's true, if you read all the way back from when it was the nation of Israel, all the way through Jesus on the cross, all the way through the epistles and the writings of Paul, the idea that underlines it all is that the blessings of God do not just come to us, they come through us and into the world. And so we have a mission and we have a job and it's a beautiful thing to be a part of that. That should make our hearts beat inside of our chests because we're so excited to go do that and to go be that for the world. And today I get to talk about what that looks like in my opinion and what I think that means. Uh, but before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about last week because last week we talked kind of about how uh, the opposite is true in this world. Right? We all fall into this tendency where the things in our lives, the material possessions, the stuff, the wealth, that becomes what defines us. And when that defines us, we start to worship it. 
And when we are defined by it and we worship it, that means that stuff is for me. I mean, that's mine. Don't tell me what to do with my money. Don't tell me what to do with my stuff. It's mine. It defines me. It's really, really important. And so what happens is we fall into the cycle more and more and more. The world's philosophy is more stuff for me. More stuff for me. It's mine. And today, (laughs) I'm going to talk about why that's a problem. Okay, this is a problem, and what I'm going to specifically talk about is why this is a problem because of Jesus, because of the person of Jesus, who he was, what he did, what he represented, and what he demonstrated here on earth. And if you're in the room today and you're not a Jesus follower, you don't, you don't, consider yourself a Christian, I believe that you have a worldview and an ethic that tells you that generosity is good and selfishness and greed is bad. But today, uh, I want to talk specifically about why, as Christians, we believe that because of Jesus and with him as the foundation, uh, that philosophy of more stuff for me is incompatible with who we believe is king and who we believe is God. And so if the world's philosophy is more stuff for me, God's philosophy is radical and complete generosity. Pour out your cup. What do you have to give? What have you been blessed with? Time, treasure, talent, everything that you have. How can we do uh, ministry? How can we be people who make changes in the world? How do we take that and start to transform the world in the present Because that's what we're here to do. That's what our job is. And it's really beautiful. Now, Jesus, this isn't like my interpretation. Jesus talks about this very, very explicitly and unapologetically. Okay, Jesus calls these things treasures. And so he says, are you going to store up treasures on earth or are you going to store up treasures in heaven? Right, that's his question that he asks. And before we get into the text, before we get into the scripture, I'll give you guys a spoiler. Okay, treasures on earth. It's not the one. You can tell because there's a yellow line through it. You're like, oh, is it treasures on earth? Nope, there's a line. It's not that one. It must be the other one. Is it treasures in heaven? There's a thumbs up emoji. That's confirmation. Emojis are beautiful. If you send me a text message without an emoji, I have no context for your emotional state, and I assume that you're mad or angry or frustrated, so use emojis. They're beautiful. Okay, so Jesus says treasures on earth or treasures in heaven, and this is what he talks about. This is on, uh, in Sermon on the Mount, which is his inaugural speech, right? His, like, inaugural sermon, putting him on the map, where he determines and, and tells people what he's going to be about. This is what I am. This is what my ministry will reflect. This is who I'm going to be. And so Matthew, uh, chapter 6, verses 19 through 24, Joel challenged us last week to read the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 6 every single day. So, you know, I read it, like, once is good. Okay, it's the gospel. It stays with you. You don't have to, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, 19 through 20. This is good because, uh, you know, two whole chapters and right smack in the middle of it, he talks about this idea of treasures, this idea of what are you building for? What are you focused on? And so here he goes, Matthew chapter 6, verses 29, or 19 through 24. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Okay, that's the yellow line. Don't do that one. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Thumbs up emoji for where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. And I'll forgive you if you're like, that's not the Jesus that I know because it kind of sounds like he's telling me what to do. It kind of sounds like he's telling me how to live my life. And the Jesus that I grew up with was like a hippie Jesus. I mean, he was like awkwardly Caucasian. He had well-conditioned brown hair. And he just walked around and told everybody to be nice. So what, what happened to him? Why is he telling me where my treasure is, there my heart will also be? Well, what you have to understand is that that's the sanitized version of Jesus. I grew up with the same one. I did, but he really did walk around and tell people this is what the kingdom of God looks like. And so when he says where your treasure is, there your heart will also be, that's a pretty heavy statement. What that means is that what you do with your stuff, what you do with your money, determines who you worship. He's basically saying, you show me how you live your life, and then I'll tell you who you worship. That's heavy sentiment. He goes on. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great 
is that darkness. Basically, what you set your eyes on, what you set your sights on, that is what you will pursue. Are your eyes set on heaven and the treasures in heaven, or are your eyes set on earth, the treasures on earth? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. Man cannot serve both God and money. And so Jesus is like throwing haymakers right now. He really is. He's coming through swinging, and he's not playing, okay? And you, what you have to understand about this before we unpack it is that throughout his whole ministry and everything he teaches and everything he shows in his relationships, in his life, the overarching theme that connects everything is the kingdom of heaven. And so what he was proclaiming is that with him coming into the world, he was ushering in this, this new kingdom, this kingdom of heaven, God's kingdom, the kingdom of God. And so he talks about this, and, and he talks about what it looks like to have the kingdom of heaven, which is opposite to the world's kingdoms, what it looks like and what participation in this new kingdom looks like. And when he talks about it, um, as you can tell, he really pulls no punches, and he uses a two-pronged approach. If you read his words, when you open your Bible, most of you will have a Bible that has his words marked in red. And when you read it, he's remarkably consistent. He's remarkably consistent in the way that he talks about this, and, and, and he uses two prongs when he does. The first prong, the thing that he always asks us, the thing that he always makes us wrestle with, is are you going to serve God? Are you going to serve God over and over again? He will back you into a corner. And the reason that we find this challenging is because he asks that question in a very binary way. Okay, so what he's saying is that are you going to serve God or are you going to serve something else? Anything else. It won't be both, so which one is it? And we're like, well, that's, I mean, calm down, man. That's kind of intense. Are you going to serve God, yes or no? Are you going to love God, yes or no? over and over again, you know, because love is not really like a feeling or an emotion. Love is a response. It's a movement. It's action. Are you going to love God? Yes or no? And he has these binary questions, and, and you know, it's not really our fault. We live in a world where our philosophical outlook is like postmodernism. It's, it's, it's post-enlightenment, rationalist thinking, and either-or questions are oppressive to us. We're like, there has to be a third way. There has to be middle ground. You say it's black or white, there's got to be gray somewhere, and I'm going to find it. Okay, this is a note that a high schooler wrote to uh, his prom date or someone he wanted to go to prom. He said, Katie, you know I have a crush on you. Will you go to prom with me? Circle your answer. Yes or definitely yes. Those are her two choices. She circled no, which I appreciate. I mean, that's very smart of her. He probably deserved it. But in his defense, that wasn't a choice. We do this all the time. We do this all the time with things in our lives. Actually, I heard about this like promposal situation that happens in high school now where like in order to get a girl to go to a dance with you, you have to put together a flash mob or something like of equal theatrical value. And when I, <laughs> when I was a senior in high school, I asked my now wife, Jenna, to prom with uh, a self-baked DiGiorno pizza. And the crispiness was probably perfect. And I put with black olives, <laughs> prom, with a question mark, which is like, okay, that's not very creative. But then also, since she was born until now, the only food that she won't eat is olives. So it's just like funny that I did that. It's whatever. If anybody has any questions for me, promposals, I'm your guy. Um, and I actually stole this from Bob Goff. Isn't that terrible? You know, Bob Goff is the author of Love Does, and, and he came to Columbus to speak. And he, he, he told this story. And I was like, Bob, would you like to come to 514 Church and talk? And he was like, I'm very famous and have many obligations. I can't. And I was like, fine, then I'm going to steal your bit. So I did. But we do this all the time. And you know, when you start to read the scriptures, when you start to read what Jesus said, like, he doesn't let you do this. He constantly makes you say, like, at some point, you will make the decision, are you going to serve God or are you going to serve something else? And then the second prom is basically, well, be careful how you answer that question. Be careful how you answer that question. Are you going to serve God? I say, yeah, I'm in. And he said, okay, well, then it looks a certain way. It looks a certain way. It does. Your life will be marked. And it's not going to be marked by the world's philosophy anymore. Whatever's governing the kingdoms here on earth, that's not what serving God looks like. When you say yes to that question... 
are you going to serve God, it looks like living by God's philosophy. It looks like living by God's philosophy, and God's philosophy is radical and complete generosity. We have a job to do. We have a mission to go on. We have people's lives to change, love to bring, hope to cultivate. We have a job right here on earth to build the kingdom of heaven, to build treasures right here in the present time. And I can prove to you that this is true because my favorite scene in the Bible, my favorite scene in the Bible is John chapter 21. And so the backstory to this is that uh, Jesus came and he said he was the Messiah. Okay, the Messiah is the chosen one, the promised one, the one who is going to save the nation of Israel from their oppressors and he was going to take the throne. And the problem is that the Messiah wasn't supposed to die. So they didn't think that he was going to die. And so when he left to go into Jerusalem where he would ultimately die, he turned to his disciples, his followers who believed he was the Messiah, and he said, where I'm going, you cannot go. And they didn't know he was talking about dying, and so Peter, his best friend, gets all puffed up, and he's like, I'll go wherever you say. I'll follow you wherever. And Jesus is like, Peter, you will deny me that you even know me three times before the sun comes up. And Peter's like, what are you talking about? How could I possibly do that to my Messiah? Well, then Jesus goes in, he gets arrested, he gets tried, he gets convicted and hung on a cross, and he dies. And the disciples' hopes are dashed. They think that they've backed the wrong horse, there is no Christian movement, and they scatter in fear. And in the midst of that panic, Peter is intimidated by a middle school girl into denying that he knows Jesus, has anything to do with Jesus, or has any association with him three times before the rooster crows, just like Jesus said. And so then Jesus comes back. And John chapter 21 is that Jesus is here in a resurrected body. Okay, he raised from the dead, new creation, resurrected. And he comes face to face with his best friend Peter who denied him, who betrayed him, who lacked faith in him. And what would you ask Peter if you were Jesus? What would you ask him? Peter, do you believe in me now? What's up, man? What you got? You got anything to say for yourself, Peter? Peter? But what he asks him should like melt our hearts. He looks at his best friend and he says, Peter, do you love me? That's what he asks him. Peter, do you love me? And there's a whole world in that question. But that's the same question that he's been asking everybody his whole ministry. Do you love me? Are you going to follow me? Do you love God? Are you going to follow God? Or are you going to follow and love something else? And he asked Peter the same question. And Peter's looking in the face of his resurrected Messiah, and he's like, you know that I love you. Stop asking me that. You know that I love you. And our hippie version of Jesus would have been like, dude, totally, bro. I love you too, man. Absolutely. But the historical Jesus and the biblical Jesus doesn't say that. The biblical Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, you know that I love you. And he says, well, then let's go do work. We got work to do, Peter. We got lives to change. We have transformation to bring. We have the gospel to share. We have work to do. You are now in this mission. You're a soldier. You're a foot soldier. Go out into the world and bring hope and bring love and pour yourself out. Peter, what do you have to give? Go give it away. And we are all called to this every single day of our lives. We have this opportunity. We really do. The people in our lives, in our work, in our circles, the people we have come in contact with, we have the ability to build the kingdom there by the way that we love, by the way that we give, by the way that we share. We have this same mission. And like I said earlier, like this should make our hearts explode with excitement. And I wonder if we want to. Sometimes. I mean, when I heard that T.D. Jakes quote, it overwhelmed me. I said, I don't know if I want a part of this. That's hard. A servant, pour yourself out, everything's for other people. I don't know if I want a part in that. And looking back on it, man, like what are we forfeiting when we don't, when we don't take that call? What are we forfeiting? When I was in college, I came home uh, for Christmas, and my whole family was home, all of my siblings and what usually happened, I, I was me, my oldest sister, Carrie, my other sister, Colleen, and then my younger brother, Kenny. And what usually happened is that my oldest sister, Carrie, and my mom would do everything. 
They would clean the house. They would cook the food. They would get the house ready. They would be ready to have people over, wrap the presents. I mean, whatever you do for Christmas, that, they, they just did it all. And me and Colleen and Kenny would just kind of sit around and do nothing useful at all. And so they were doing this, and my mom's watching on the live stream right now. She's like, you're describing any number of occasions. You're going to have to be more specific. It was a specific Christmas, and her and my sister were getting everything ready. My sister Carrie was in the kitchen, and my mom was running errands, and my mom called her. My mom called Carrie, and she said, and I don't know exactly what she was saying, but Carrie was like reassuring her, so I think she was panicked or anxious about what all, everything they had to get together. And Carrie was like, it's okay, Mom, like, you keep doing that. I'm here. I'll keep doing this. And when you get home, we'll figure all this out. <laughs> and as we were laying on the couch doing nothing, my sister Colleen yelled into the kitchen. In the middle of this conversation, she's like, Carrie. And Carrie's like, what? Why are you yelling at me? And Colleen's like, um, tell Mom not to ask me to do anything. <laughs> I was like, that's the most inappropriate thing I've ever heard. That blows away all social context, all appropriateness. That, that's ridiculous. I text it to my family like three times a week. It's so funny to me. Tell mom not to ask me to do anything. She's so lazy. She was like 22 at the time. She wasn't even young. And this is funny here because it's inconsequential, but like I look at my own life and I reflect, and I'm like, how many times do I do this in my faith? How many times do I say, tell God not to ask me to do anything? When I'm overwhelmed, when I'm tired, I don't know if I want a part of this mission on a day-to-day -day basis. That sounds taxing. And this is our call, and this is our mission. And all that you have to do to, to realize this is look at the life and the ministry of Jesus when he was here on earth. That's all you have to do. Jesus, uh, you know, his life was really, really important. And sometimes we read the Bible as Protestant, Western, evangelical Christians, and we think that the whole gospel is a preamble to the cross. All that's just kind of the lead up. That's the introduction. It's an extended intro to the cross. And the cross is central to our faith. I'm not trying to deny that. But I think when we do that, we miss something really, really important. We miss how significant Jesus' life is. And so take a step back and think about what Jesus' life represented. Okay, it wasn't a new ethic. It wasn't a new moral code. He wasn't a wise teacher or sage who came into the world and said a couple cool things that people hadn't thought about before. Jesus here on earth is a picture of what it looks like when heaven comes to earth. It's a picture of what happens when God's space invades human space. It's a picture of a human heart that's fully transformed. Have you ever asked yourself the question, what would all this look like if God was in charge? Well, we have a very, very lengthy historical narrative that shows us exactly that. It's an agenda for new humanity. And what was he doing? What was his ministry characterized by? Where was he? He was in the middle of people. He was in relationship with people, and he was there in the midst of their pain and suffering proximate to them, in the middle of their joy and celebration, in the midst of their death and disease and illness, and he was there in relationship, and he was touching, and he was healing, and he was bringing hope and restoration and redemption to people who needed it. And when he says, go feed my sheep, when he says, let's go do work, when he says, as I did for you, go do for them, that's not some ethereal spiritual calling that we have. That is what we are to do. We are to go be like him on this earth. We're to be with people, pour ourselves out, give our talents, give our treasures, give our time, and start building the kingdom right here on earth, in the present, just like he did. And this is a crazy, crazy, crazy life when you look at the ministry of Jesus, and are we really supposed to look like that? And so some of the greatest authors and poets and songwriters have tried to describe what this sort of selfless life looks like here on earth. How, how does it look to really give yourself away, to really be selfless? And one of my favorite works of this is a guy, his name is Peter Rollins. And Peter Rollins wrote a book called The Orthodox Heretic. And in The Orthodox Heretic, there's a short story called Salvation for a Demon. Okay, and it's a parable. And what he's getting at in this story is how our radical generosity Living by God's philosophy and pouring our cup out has the ability to transform the people around us and transform the world around us. And so he, he tells this story and he sets the scene. He says that there's an old priest 
And the priest is known throughout the land for his radical hospitality and generosity. Anything that somebody needs who shows up at his door, he will give to them. He views every person as a being created in the image of God and therefore just as worthy of love and dignity and hope as Christ himself. And all that's like well and good, but it becomes much more dramatic when an actual monster shows up at his church, a demon knocks on his church door. He opens the church door and he stares into the face of a monster. And the demon says, I'm traveling and I'm weary. Can I come in for some shelter? And the priest says, absolutely, without hesitation, come on inside. The monster walks into the church. The demon, he he destroys the holy artifacts. He spits and he curses and he blasphemies all throughout the church until it's time to go home. And all the while, the priest is just calmly and quietly going about his daily devotional. And then he locks up the church and he leaves and the demon follows him home. And the monster knocks on his house door and for the second time that day, the priest comes face to face with the demon and the demon says, you let me into your church for shelter. Will you let me into your home for food? I'm hungry and I need a bite to eat. And the priest said, of course, you can come inside. And so the demon comes into the priest's home and he destroys his holy artifacts And he spits and he curses and he blasphemies all throughout the house. And the priest calmly and quietly prepares, serves, and eats dinner until it's time to go to bed. And before he ascends up the stairs, the demon stops him and he says, you let me into your church for shelter. You let me into your home for food. I have one more question before I go. Will you let me into your heart? A demon asks him that. And the priest looks at him confusedly and says, of course. All that I have is yours, and all that I am is yours. And at this outpouring of genuine generosity, hospitality, love, and compassion, the demon starts to shrink and shrivel, and he walks away transformed into something else. Because the very thing he sought to take from the priest, which was his love of God manifest in his love of people, his mission, his God-given ability to make changes in this world through what he pours out is the very thing that the priest refused to give up. And so the priest just walked up the stairs and he shook his head and went to bed wondering what disguise his Christ would take next. And it's a beautiful story. It really is a beautiful story. In the commentary on it, Peter Rollins gets into it and he says, it's all but impossible to live this kind of crazy life of radical generosity, giving away what you have. But when we do, when we try, when we believe that we're marked by it, and when we believe that we're soldiers in what's happening right here in the present, what happens is your ability to give yourself away, to pour out, starts to transform the people around you, your communities, your cities, your countries. And it's so powerful that it has the ability to transform demons. But more likely than that, the monsters and the demons that you run into aren't really, you know, demons at all. They're just people who are broken and battered and bruised and need hope and salvation just like you and just like me. And it's such a beautiful story. I mean, it's such a beautiful depiction of what it looks like to be selfless people, to live this mission, to believe that we're kingdom builders, to store up treasures in heaven. You know, I think that this phrase, store up treasures in heaven, is much more literal than we think it is. I do. I do. And what does this look like to store up treasures in heaven? What does it look like to pour yourself out? I want to give a couple examples, and this is just, you know, this is not me saying that I do this. I want everybody to know that. This is not me saying that I do this, that I'm good at this, that this is the way I live my life so you should live yours. I struggle with this just as much as anything else, and I hope and pray that my heart is transformed into a sort of life like this, just like I pray for all of you guys. And so two of the ways that I think are applicable in our lives practically is to be generous materially. I do. I think that all of us, most of us, some more than others, have, have the ability to change the world, to change people's lives, to change and give dignity because we have resources. I believe that we're called to that. If you have the ability to make changes in the world with your material possessions, we should go do that. And you know, we have people in this community who do this every single day. I sit across the table with some of the most generous people that I've ever met. I really do. People who give 20% of their income to the church 
And I know that they give other parts of it away as well. I sat with somebody uh, recently who's been a part of this church for a long time, and he thinks it's his mission. He thinks that it's on his heart. He thinks that God has given him the task of building churches by funding them and by helping them grow with his resources. And so he gives his money away. He gives his money away. I sat with somebody else who said that, uh, you know, he's very generous and they give, and, and we talked to him about what the future plans were for our building, for, for how we're going to grow, how we're going to do all this. And he stopped us and he said, you know, I believe that I'm called to give because I believe I can make a difference. Um, you know, if you guys took my money and you went to Vegas and you put it all on black, I would still give because I'm not giving to you because I think you're smart. And I was like, excuse me, it's rude. But I actually liked that sentiment. And so me and Joel went to Vegas and we put it all on black. And that's why we don't have a building. I'm sorry. That's why. I'm just kidding. Ethan, edit that out. I never said that. I wouldn't say that. Seriously, be generous material. I mean, we have the means. It's the easiest generosity that you can do. I know it doesn't feel like it. I know it doesn't feel like it. It's much easier than pouring yourself out in the next one. So be generous materially. Think about what you have to give, how you can make a difference, how you can bring dignity and hope to people who need it. Be generous relationally. Be generous relationally. Uh, every single one of us, every day, in informal and small ways, has the ability to transform people's lives. The people at your job, the people that you see in public, the barista at Starbucks, the waiter at a restaurant, these are people, I guarantee you, you run into people every day who don't know if they're loved. They don't know if they're cared about. They don't know if they're worthy. They don't know if they deserve people to like them and to love them and to care about them. And when you're intentional and when you give your time and when you give a little bit of yourself in those moments, you have the ability to start to transform the way that they feel about themselves, about the world, about hope in general. And we're called to do that in more formal ways. We have people in this church who are involved in prison ministries. They go into prisons, the people of this world who not only do we say they're forgotten about, but we say that they should be forgotten about. They go into these prisons, into these moments, these, these boxes of hopelessness, and they share the gospel, and they share Jesus, and they tell these people that they're loved, and their lives are transformed. You should hear these stories. You should hear the stories of these people. We have over 100 people in this church who lead small groups. I mean, we say that we're a staff-led church, but like we're really not. We're a volunteer-led church. A hundred people who let people into their homes. They share their hospitality with them. They lead them through curriculum. They invest in them relationally because they believe that in those moments and in that environment, transformation can happen. That God's blessings will come through them and people's lives can change. And, and, and the way that I'm going to wrap this up is that I believe that this is all spiritual. You know, this is all evangelism. Sometimes the, that word evangelism seems bad because we think it's going on a street corner and yelling at people about repenting. But it's not. Evangelism, sharing the good news, sharing the gospel is a holistic approach in our lives that will be shown way more than it's said. And so when you are generous with your stuff, when you're generous with what you own materially, when you're generous with your relationships, with your emotions, with what you have to give, people are affected and they see something that's different and they will ask you about it. Why do you live your life that way? Why do you live like that? What is it that you're hoping in that makes you different from everybody else? And what you'll realize is that all of a sudden you are a much better evangelist than you ever thought possible because you've already shown it. You've already proven it. You stored your treasure in heaven. So that's where your heart is. And so when we're generous materially and we're generous relationally, people will start to ask you about why you're like that, about who you worship and why it's different than them. And then finally, um, I actually believe, as I said earlier, that treasures in heaven means that we're actually building. I do. I don't think that this is some spiritual thing. I think that this means we're building things. I think this means that when we live God's philosophy and we pour ourselves out and we give what we have to people, in those moments, in those interactions, eternal things are happening. 
I do. I think that that's true. I think that what we do in the present lasts into God's future. I think it has to. It's the only way our faith makes any sense. And so what that means is that when you start to live this way, when you start to pour out your cup, when you start to ask the question, how much more can I give to bring love to people, to bring Jesus to people? What happens, you know, when you give money to a social justice organization, when you tithe to a local church and you become a stakeholder in salvation and life change? What happens when you show up on Sunday mornings and you set this whole thing up so that we can have church? What happens when you hold the door and you let people come inside and you make them feel warm and welcome when you lead a small group and you let people into your home and you build community? What happens in these moments is that God is building his kingdom through us right here in the present and that building, that kingdom work that we're doing literally lasts forever. Paul says that our work is not in vain. Be steadfast in your well-doing. Because when we pour ourselves out, we're literally building heaven. We are. We're building for the future heaven. We are building God's kingdom on earth and restoration happens and transformation happens. And that's how the world has changed. I really believe that. I really do. And I wonder if we want to answer that call. I ask myself this question all the time and I usually don't like the answer that I give. And so when, you, when you're feeling this, when you're reflecting on this, when you're trying to figure out how much more do I have left? I mean, I have a job. I have kids. I pour myself out all day. How much more can I pour? I want you guys to take it to God. And this is something that I'm learning right now. I don't mean go to God and ask for forgiveness because you're not living right. That is not at all what I'm saying. Go to God and ask him to allow you to do this. Ask him to increase my capacity to love. There's only so much of us that we can pour out. But when we start to be transformed, when our lives start to be touched by Jesus, when we start to change, all of a sudden we have more and more and more ability to give away. And I want us to take that to God. God, please increase my capacity to love. Increase my capacity to build for the kingdom. Increase my ability to be a changer, to be a transformer. Increase my capacity to bring heaven on earth right here in the present. I really, really believe in this community. I really do. I really believe in, in the abilities that we have, in our ability to change the world, and I wouldn't be here if I didn't. And I love you guys. Thank you for being here. I'm going to close us in prayer, and then we, can, then we can go, all right? God, thank you so much for being with us today. I just pray that your presence is here. I pray that you work in our hearts. I pray that you work to transform us so that we have the ability to take what we have and to go pour it out, to go build the kingdom, to go bring restoration, to go bring hope to this world and to the brokenness that's here. God, when we're tired, when we don't have it in us, I pray that we go to you and I pray that you increase our capacity to love, increase our capacity to be difference makers, increase our capacity to be transformers, Lord. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you guys, we love you. Appreciate it.